Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Again, Matthew chapter 4. We're still in Matthew chapter 4, and Christ has prayed and fasted 40 days in the wilderness. He's overcome the devil's temptations by the scripture, by the word of God, the first 11 verses here. Let me continue reading, beginning at verse 12 down through verse 16. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now the Lord Jesus begins his public ministry. The four gospels, or what's sometimes called the synoptic gospel, that means like four views of the same events. Think of two words that mean the same thing. We call them synonyms. Uh, four views of the ministry of Christ called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They can be matched with each other, and there are a number of books by Christian writers that have done that. The details one records, put alongside the details another one records, so that they're organized in a very logical sequence. And the quotation here, verses 14 to 16, is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. We'll turn to Isaiah 9 in just a minute. But Christ uh, now going to Nazareth from Capernaum is about 20 miles north east from one place to the other. And he ends up on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 16 here says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Well, a spiritual and devotional application of this is pretty simple, is pretty obvious. Um, the great light that the people saw that's Christ himself. Look, keep your finger, go forward to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and John chapter 1, and we'll start there at verse 6. John 1, verse 6, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He, John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And also look forward at John chapter 8. John 8, and Christ says in verse 12, or we read in verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So for spiritual or inspirational application of this part of Matthew or that prophecy of Isaiah, the light is Christ himself. The shadow of death must deal with man's sinful condition. Run forward to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, and notice there verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, turn back, if you will, now to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9. And 
And our text quoted from verses 1 and 2, but notice here verse 3. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. And that's very true. God said, I'll multiply thee, and make thy seed as the stars of the heaven, uh, that if man can count the stars, so shall thy seed be numbered. And uh, God certainly fulfilled that. There are Jews scattered all over the world over the centuries from Abraham on. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Much of the, and I want to say this respectfully, much of the problem for the Jewish people today is that they take pride in their physical, uh, earthly achievements, their education, their status, their technological developments, their advancements in science and medicine, um, and you name it. They, they take great pride in those things. But those blessings, for some reason, don't seem to drive them closer to the Lord God. Those blessings are all the reason they, they need to say, I don't need God. I've got all these things without living close to God, so why do I need them? And as far as that goes, just about everybody that's unsaved, an unbeliever, looks at life that way. If they suddenly had the winning ticket to the lottery and they got a windfall of millions of dollars, they would think, this is the blessing from the Lord, I don't need God. And don't even suggest that they tithe at least 10 to 15% of it, right? <laughs> That's the last thing in the world they'd want to do with all that. But these, those kinds of physical uh, fortunes, they say, can't be the hand of God. I did it myself. And don't want to give God credit for helping them to achieve anything that they do achieve. But those things, uh, so, so the Jew rejoices much as a farmer who's bringing in his crops. He's happy that he succeeded in having a good harvest, but doesn't think beyond that. Look at verse 4 here in Isaiah 9. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. The Bible says the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in the times of trouble, Psalm 9, verse 9. To judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress psalm 10 verse 18 psalm 50 and verse 15 and call upon me in the day of trouble and i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me and uh, jeremiah 30 verse 7 refers to that time such as was not since the beginning of the world is a time even of jacob's trouble so the Jews will pray, keep us as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. Psalm 17, verses 8 and 9. Uh, Isaiah uh, 9, verse 4, is a picture of the tribulation, a picture of the Antichrist and the Jew in his worst time of persecution, his worst time of trouble. And notice what comes next there in Isaiah 9, verse 5. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this, this battle, shall be with burning and fuel of fire. That's a great picture of the battle of Armageddon, followed by a great messianic prophecy, verses 6 and 7, a victorious conqueror. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Both natures of Christ are described, or rather they are alluded to, I should say. Unto us a child is born. Well, that's going to be Christ's physical birth in Bethlehem, the virgin birth as a babe, his physical nature. 
unto us a son is given. Well, as the Son of God, as the third member of the Godhead, Christ has always existed. He never had a beginning. He prayed in John 17, verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The Bible says, Whose goings forth had been from of old, from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, uh, Micah 5, verse 2. Uh, he's referred to as the Ancient of Days, Daniel chapter 9, or 7, verse 9, and 7, verse 13, and 7, verse 22. Uh, then his rule as king over planet Earth and the rest of the universe by extension is alluded to there in verse 9 of our text. Or, or verse 9 in uh, Isaiah 9. Or verse 7. I meant verse 7, not verse 9. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Not the, not the length of time. Not, that's not what he means. But the size and the scope of his government and peace. There shall be no end. Do you know when God gave a commission to Adam and his wife to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. If sin had never entered into the world, then God would never have had to cast out the man and the woman. Death would not have come. And it's safe to assume they would still be alive today. If they were still alive today, fulfilling that commission to be fruitful and to multiply, and to replenish the earth. You know how crowded this world would be right now? Without any sin, without any judgment, without any flood to set them back. How crowded do you think this world would be? We'd have 500 people fighting for every square foot of land. So when it says the increase of his government, that's not the duration of time. That's the size and the scope. It's going to have to expand out into the universe. But it's not made for sinful men in their natural flesh to dominate. Oh, we can go up there when you leave some litter around on the moon. If we even, if we even went to the moon. Amen. I mean, all my life I've believed that we went to the moon. I want to believe it. But as an adult, as a grown man, I've begun to consider some of the arguments that can be very persuasive arguments and questions about whether or not we actually did. But one year before that, 1968, we were, we were trying to launch rockets. We couldn't get them off a the launching pad. We had no navigation skills, hardly. They'd, cr they'd fly up and they'd fly, crash back down. We were crashing rockets all over the place. And I think in one year's time, we were able to go around the moon, come back, and then go to the moon, land men there, and bring them back. That's a huge advancement in technology and, uh, and computer uh, control that transpire in one year, one and a half year of time. But we were also competing with the Soviet Union to see who is more dominant in sp space or in science and so forth. And uh, now without me getting into it, now some of you watching on YouTube, please don't make comments about the astronauts and the flat earth and all that nonsense. Um, I don't believe in a flat earth, and I'm not going to accept your arguments for a flat earth. So let me look right into the camera and say you'll be wasting your time. <laughs> you have a flat head, but the earth isn't flat. The, um, so I have entertained some of the arguments and the, the speculation, and there can be some very persuasive arguments made to cast doubt on whether whether the moon landing ever occurred. But I want to believe it. I'll say that. I want to believe it. But God's not going to let man uh, clutter up space with his space vehicles and his lunar module, lunar rover, uh, and satellites all over the place because the universe is there for the occupancy of a glorified race of beings you and I will be a part of one day. 
And if Adam was still fulfilling his commission to multiply and replenish, the earth would be too crowded to keep all the people on it. So the, the increase of Christ's government has to spread out and expand into the universe one day. Now, let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 17 before we uh, conclude today. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We talked about this in one of our Wednesday night lessons uh, not long ago, a month or two months ago. John the Baptist came preaching the same thing. Look at Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The words God and heaven are not synonyms. The kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven, those are not two expressions that mean the same thing. In fact, they're two different words. They don't even share any common letters of the alphabet. There are two different uh, kingdoms, one without the, the kingdom of heaven and one within the kingdom of God. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, those are, those are physical things, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So there's a kingdom without, a worldly, earthly kingdom, a physical kingdom, over which kings and emperors and princes and presidents have been fighting and going to war with each other to dominate, to rule, and there's a kingdom within, a, a spiritual relationship between you and God. Christ said to the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24. Some outward action, some physical membership in a denomination or a particular religion of some kind cannot affect a spiritual change in here. As I mentioned during our church hour, water baptism can't wash away the sin that's in your heart. Becoming a member of a church doesn't mean your name is recorded in heaven. When Christ told the the dying thief, the repentant thief on the cross next to him today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. All that man did was exercise faith. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Today, this, or this day I say unto thee, thou shalt be with me in paradise. He had no time to come off the cross and get baptized and join a church and any number of things. The Apostle Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. So the gospel that saves a sinner has nothing to do with water baptism. It doesn't require water baptism. When we baptize a new convert, a new Christian, all we're doing is we're helping that Christian to testify of their faith in Christ. I want to illustrate by water baptism, I'm illustrating something that took place inside me. Something dead inside me was buried and something new has risen to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. The water itself uh, affects nothing. You get in, you get wet, you have to dry your hair off afterwards. Maybe that's why the Catholic Church just does the sprinkling, so people's hair doesn't get wet, right? <laughs> but there's two kingdoms. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Just go forward a page or so. Matthew 5. And let me begin there at verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, that heaven and earth, excuse me, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is something that you enter into by your degree of obedience to some commandments. 
You have to keep commandments. Moses told the nation of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. We'll do exactly what we've been told to do, and it will result in our righteousness. But even that wasn't worth much. Isaiah, I think, chapter 65 says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So the best you can offer still isn't as good as what Jesus Christ has to offer you. Uh, in the New Testament, Titus 3, verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that washes and regenerates and renews a sinner who turns to God. So there are two kingdoms, one outward, the kingdom of heaven, and one inward, the kingdom of God. Uh, later in this Sermon on the Mount, notice what Christ said, or actually um, keeping certain commandments as a means of gaining entrance into the kingdom of heaven uh, is clear enough. Look at here, Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So while you're seeking to keep those commandments, you may be persecuted and suffer hardship in trying to do so. But look later at the same Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Notice what Christ says in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, the outward, the physical things, shall be added unto you. He says, all these, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. You know, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Where shall we, what shall we be clothed with? And all of those things. He says, your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of those things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And Paul says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, which is what Christ said the Gentiles were seeking after. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Right now, the Gentile nations, those who are not Jewish, are running the world's affairs. They're running the world's politics. They're running the world's government system. They're running the world's economic system. They're trying to take their armies and go to war with another nation's army and conquer each other's land and territory. Uh, that's called the times of the Gentiles. And one day, that's going to come to an end he says, this is what the, this, after all these things do the Gentiles seek. But your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. And he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So two kingdoms were being offered, one within and one without, to the nation of Israel. But since the Jew wanted to reject the one within that came by the Lord Jesus Christ, God didn't give them the one without. And then he took the, the gospel of uh, the grace of God and offered it to whosoever will. He came unto his own, and his, his own received him not, John 1.10. But as many as received him, Jew or Gentile, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1.11. <laughs> so the kingdom of God... Um, the spiritual kingdom is offered to Jew or Gentile. The physical kingdom is offered primarily and almost exclusively to the nation of Israel. But God said, not to worry. I, I got the, 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 the Jew will inherit the world. We'll have a place to live on and a place to dominate. But I got something prepared for the Gentile, the ones who are not Jews, who entered into the, the bride of Christ. It's called New Jerusalem. That'll be the dwelling place of the saints in eternity one day. But um, so two kingdoms were clearly being offered.